Welcome to the Cult of Domesticity podcast. I'm Courtney. And I'm Ashley. And today we're talking about the acid bath murders as a final, well, my final October podcast episode. You didn't just try to bury the lead on that, like, <laughs> really? Just the acid bath murders. And by the way, it's the last one in October. Yeah, okay. Well, it's my last one in October. I know I it is. Do, do big or go home. <laughs> okay. All right. That's fair. Uh, apologies for any loud dar- dog barking. Schnitzel's inside, and she's a she's a German Shepherd, even with her little reflective jacket. And I can, if you want to see it, make sure you comment about it because I will post a picture of her and her cute little reflective jacket. It is adorable. precious. I've seen a picture. It's real cute. It's real cute. Um. Also, if you hear a baby crying in the background, that's my nephew. He's sick. We're not torturing him, I promise. He's just real stubborn. (laughs) But, yeah. Ashley, have you ever heard of the acid bath murders? I have not. Something tells me this is going to be a wild ride. I'm excited. You want to know how I heard about this? Probably your weird murder map show. Yes, because I love true crime and I love maps. (laughs) It is a show made for me. (laughs) <laughs> and it's British, so it, it, it checks all the boxes. I tried to say tick and check. That was real bad. That was real bad. <laughs> so, yes. Between 1944 and 1949, John George Haight killed, as far as we know, six people. That's ominous. Um, be- because he was convinced that he could, could uh, carry out the perfect murder. And uh, most of the my information is actually coming from the murder maps, their website, and well as um, Dr. Jonathan Oates, his book, John George Hate, the Acid Bath Murderer, a Portrait of a Serial Killer and His Victim. It's a nice academic tome. That's got to be... Off talking about sources. That has to be the longest title outside of a 17th century pamphlet on independence that I've ever heard. I know longer. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Let's not make this a title like the pissing contest. Continue with the acid baths. Yes, she saw my footnote for one of my sources that was six lines long. Um, <laughs> yes, I did. So he believed that if you didn't have a body, you can't convict anyone of murder. So he dissolved his victims in sulfuric acid and then would pour the sludge down the drain or what into. Is- <laughs> This is Breaking Bad, but in the 1940s? A little bit. (laughs) Um, So later he claimed he had claimed to have drank their blood, and the Daily Mirror dubbed him a vampire. I mean, it's the Daily Mirror, though. Grain of salt there. (laughs) That's why I kept it, because I knew you would love it. Yeah, really reputable source there, Court. Good job. (laughs) <laughs> That's murder maps. Don't play me. No, I'm sorry. I bet their source is a little harder. <laughs> so the reason why I ended up using Oates' book, one, because it was it's an academic jargon that I love. <laughs> but he just started off talking about, like, he's like, no, we're going to look beyond what Hate said about his early life because it's pretty much all his early life and every reason why is from him. So he's like, yeah. we're going to look at other sources, try to figure out this guy from everything around him to either contradict or like confirm what he's saying i mean that makes sense to me yeah so most of the information on hate came from him after his arrest for murder which he gave to his defense attorneys Mm -hmm. and a newspaper (laughs) so you know great information great reputable no way that that's gonna be biased towards him in any way shape or form it's yeah. all going to be fine. So, even more fun about finding information on his early life. Uh, he has no siblings, no close childhood friends. Red flag. And his parents said little. Like, just didn't talk? No, they just didn't really talk about him. Oh, well. Like, the press and stuff. <laughs> I mean, I don't blame them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, his parents were pretty much normal 
people. His father, John Robert Hay, was born in a suburb of Yorkshire, and he, like, you know, his his grandfather was a coal wayman, and his mother was a like home. His grandmother was a homemaker, and then his mom was from Shropshire, and her father was also a coal miner. And you know, they they married their solid working people from Yorkshire. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, they're nonconformists. Which do you know what nonconformists are? I think so, but tell me anyway. So, basically. In England, in the UK, there's nonconformists are basically non-Anglican or Church of England Protestants. Okay. And so they just don't follow the Church of England, but they're still Protestants. So they're it's like in the hierarchy, they're better than Catholics, <laughs> but not by much. <laughs> they can vote. <laughs> when the Catholics couldn't vote because they were Catholic in like whole offices, mm-hmm. nonconformists could. Okay. Yeah, we'll get uh, we'll get into that a little in a little bit. Um, so little baby John was born the twenty fourth of July, nineteen oh nine. He was an only child after eleven years of marriage, and their pa- his parents soon moved to a mining community in Yorkshire. So he's like a think of like a Billy Elliot style community, if you will. Okay, mining town. But instead of in the 80s, it's in the 40s, so everything's still booming, and it's okay. Right, well, gotcha. before World War One, sorry, before World War One, so like everything's still booming. Um, so they're not rich, they're not poor, but they're they pretty, they're doing good. Hate said his his father was unemployed when he was born, and they were in like poverty and all of that. Even though the mining town was doing so well, yeah, but there's no evidence of it. Okay. Yeah. Um. So hit. And, like, they belong, so they belong, they're doing okay. Mm-hmm. They belong to this nonconformist, they're called the Brethren. Mm-hmm. Um, and Hate said about them, their sect was known as the particular people. Their religious beliefs were more important to them than anything else in life. They lived by precepts, They t- and they talked in parable. It is true to say that I was nurtured on Bible stories, mostly concerned with sacrifice. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> Yep. So basically, this group, the Brethren, think Calvinism and Pietism with an emphasis on the Second Coming. Awesome. Just mix it all up. It's for gonna nice go Halloween really well. Stew. Maybe don't use the stew metaphor in something called the acid <laughs> bath murders. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> Make me. <laughs> um. And Kate's father was um, a respected higher-up member in the Brethren. Um, basically, he got to hear complaints from misbehaving members and judge them. Sounds like a good time. Oh, oh yeah. So, young Hate also get, got experience to other sorts of religion. Mm-hmm. You know, because at 10 or 11... He would he would walk to Wakefield Cathedral at five in the morning. I'm not walking anywhere at five in the morning, let alone to choir practice. Um, and it was a three mile walk. The cathedral was part of the Anglican Church and was completely different for hate um, because the brethren are very much very restrictive, confining mm-hmm. Protestantism, and. But his parents still encouraged him to go because they thought it would be a help for his education, getting him into a grammar school. Wait, to go, sorry, they encouraged him to go to the Anglican church? To sing, to be in the choir so he could make connections and he could become a scholarship boy. All about that networking. It's like pre-internet LinkedIn. All right. Yeah. Okay. It's how people network to get their kids into school now. I mean- yeah, that's you're not wrong. Believe it or not, Hate wasn't an angel at this point, as um, one of the men who worked under his father uh, recalled, saying he was a little bully. Um, he adding that Hate was never complained of or chastised because his parents were unapproachable, and because as a senior employee at the colliery, aka mining stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Kate Sr. might be able to get the complaint, the complainant fired. Okay, so he's, like, the entitled, spoiled rich kid. Minus maybe the rich part. (laughs) Okay, awesome. This is all looking like a really good recipe for acid murder stew. Yeah, so, um, there were schools in Outwood where they lived at that point, but Hate didn't attend them. At seven, he went to a prep school. Mm -hmm. I cannot say the full word. Preparatory? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it, which, I mean, is a great way to move up classes. True. You're, you're rubbing elbows with all those upper middle class people. Very um, posh. Yeah. <laughs> the Jack Whitehalls of the world. Oh my god, yes! <laughs> so he was a, an average student. But he never took the school certificate, a.k.a. what is now the UK's O-levels. Mm-hmm. And... So he sort of didn't graduate? Yeah, kind of like he didn't get that final step. Okay. Okay. Um, but he did really well in science and music. Hmm. All right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. After he left schools, he worked at a variety of different jobs, normally, like, either getting fired or like having to leave like he worked as a clerk for the for the council he worked at a garage he was an insurance salesman all the while you know he's not smoking not drinking which is weird (laughs) <laughs> if anyone's ever seen Peaky Blinders, because you're pretty much staring at people like, how are you standing up straight? Oh, yeah. Um, and he was actually quite promiscuous. Oh, scandalous. Yeah, yeah which if you've known anything, you know, like, more modern serial killers, it's not normally It's not very case. common. Yeah. Um, also, he had a love affair with cars. Okay. Well, yeah, for th- I mean, that makes sense. They're the new big thing that all of those fancy schoolmates were probably getting into. Yeah. And so he had, in the early 1930s, he had at least three cars in his garage. A Ford 8, a, Whoa, a Telma Dark he- Clock, and an Italian Alfa Romeo. And if you look in the podcast, our Google Drive, there's a Photos. And if you look at the first one, you get to see a picture of little baby hate. All right, hold on. Let me pull it up. Oh, he was kind of actually cute as a little kid. I could see him at, like, a little prep school being all British. Choir. Yeah, I could see it. Um, and I will put these up on Facebook and probably Facebook more than Twitter because Twitter doesn't allow us to have that many photos. But um, And then if you click, go to the next one. Mm-hmm. That's an older George Hate. I mean, he's still not completely awful looking, anyway. No, he looks like a, except for the eyes, he looks like a standard middle class man. And even the eyes, like, for that time period, they're probably not that unusual. He just looks like someone who's been to war, but I bet he probably wasn't. So, just keep that well-poshed, middle class, early 1930s man in your mind. Okay. Um, who has three cars in his garage while he's working as a as an insurance salesman. How Could did he, he afford, afford them? them? Well, the best guess is he embezzled. Okay. I mean, looking at the, <laughs> this picture, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of, like, a comparison for him right now, but I can't think of anyone that he looks like. No, not really. Yeah. I can't either. Um, also, at this time, he's disassociating himself from like his parents' religion and really most religions. Mm-hmm. Um, he also gets married to okay. Beatrice Hammer um, July 6th, 1934 at the Burlington Registry Office um, and neither of their families were there. An auspicious start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so he described himself uh, in the register as a company director. He was a car salesman. 
and his <laughs> wife was recorded as having no occupation. Okay. Which is not uncommon. Yeah, no. Um, their marriage only lasted a few months. Shocker. Well, at that time, as uh, Dr. Oates says, the only way to get out of your parents' house originally was mm-hmm. to get married. So you would live with them until you got married. So gotcha. that's the way to get out. That makes sense. That's sad, but it makes sense. Yeah, so they both were kind of doing that to get out of their parents' house. Yeah, it was a very brief courtship, <laughs> followed by the wedding at the registrar's office. But And then a also- very brief marriage. Yeah, well, the brief marriage really was because hate had started criminal activities before Mm, okay did she find out about them and wasn't pleased or how'd that Um, go down you know i think she found out after okay because he seems like the kind of person who was very charming and could just charm his way out of everything real ted bundy character well, they found evidence that he had forged his headmaster's, like, he was an expert forger, so he was forging, like, his headmaster's, like, signature and handwriting in his school books. Um, yeah, so he did a lot of insurance fraud and other financial crimes. Basically, he's a white-collar cr- criminal at this point. Something tells me he's not going to remain that way, mostly because this started with acid bath murder. <laughs> I'm still not over that. Oh, we'll get to it. Um... So, the most extensive fraud that got him imprisoned at first was he worked with um, a gentleman, Lambert, and um, this girl, Alice, to defraud a car dealership, basically. Mm -hmm. So, they had Alice take on the persona of Amy Sargentson, who was an affluent Leeds secondary school teacher. Okay. Um, and they had her go in and saying, I want to get finance for this car from a, this garage that Hate and Lambert owned in 1934. Okay. I'm going to go with, you know, they were found out. Yeah. And they go to court and the judge, is, they're, they're, in England, they're called the sizes at this point still. Mm-hmm. So basically, court only comes up once. They're becoming more frequent, but they used to be... I can't go into the history of this. It'll take too long. It's okay. But basically, traveling courts. Okay. They used to be traveling courts. That's why they're called the sizes. Okay. Um, I'm going too in-depth, but I want to. <laughs> I want to so bad. It's in um, your nature. But anyways, Lambert was only fined 25 pounds and held to good behavior for a year. Then Alice was fined 5 pounds and held for the year of good behavior as well. Hate was determined most guilty, given a prison sentence of 15 months, and um, and they asked for the other six offenses that he, he had done in June to September to be taken into account, because hmm. they knew he was the leader. Interesting. Yeah. So while he's in prison, his... Um, his wife, Beatrice, had a baby, and basically he hadn't provided for her at all, so she gave the baby up for adoption. Basically, they just separate because they're horrible for each other. Fair. They never divorce. And I recommend reading Oates' book because he does a really good um, deconstruction of her story. Basically, she was a bigamist. Oh, wait, what? Yeah. Because they never got divorced, but she got to with someone else? Yeah, she got remarried twice. She oh. Got, yeah. Wait, twice? I believe so, if I'm remembering correctly. But I recommend going to read the book. It's excellent. Um, Interesting. Okay. Yeah. On leaving the prison December 8th, 1935, Hate returned to his parents' home, and he actually got let out after a little more than 12 months from good behavior in prison hmm why do you seem suspicious no just that whole good behavior system bothers me i get that it's overcrowded but but, uh, anyway (laughs) um so then in 1936 he he leaves the yorkshire area travels to glasgow 
and then travels to London, where, um, in London, mind you, this is the first time he's ever left Yorkshire. So he goes to Glasgow and then he goes to London. He tries to teach himself law. <laughs> most... Good luck. Well, it's probably just enough, according to us, to impress someone who doesn't know law. Yeah. Um. So in June and July, he went to um the public companies registry in London, where he looks up details of directors and shareholders of companies whose shares were listed on the stock exchange. Okay. Then on May 31st, he applies for an accommodation address in Guildford and was given possession at the beginning of June. Mm -hmm. Also in the beginning of June, he had 400 to 500 envelopes typed at, um, typed to various shareholders throughout the country and just kept offering larger duplicate shares. This and... Under the persona of William Cato Addison, solicitor, BSC, and what do you think he was doing? He's running a scam. Yep. Uh, he was pretending to be a solicitor responsible for winding up the estates of the recently deceased. <sighs> what a dick. So basically he would have people with, were supposed to send checks to buy up some shares that mm -hmm. people, like dead people had. And he would cash the checks and then disappear. So he would close the office and everything and then open it up somewhere else. So he did this a couple um, in, like, a couple regions of London. But he was caught, of course, because he thinks he's really smart. Yeah, but he he's kinda, not. He's not smart enough. Um, and he goes to the Cannon Street Police Station and they searched his rooms, and they found a bunch of stuff that made him look super <laughs> guilty. Because he was. And so, Hate pleaded guilty, but swore that he was merely a clerk in this operation. And he did not know what, it, what he was doing was wrong until it was too late. Then his boss told him, you can't tell the police, otherwise you'll be incriminated as well. b b, -b, -b, -b bullshit <laughs> I don't know why you think it's bullshit. Maybe because it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the judge also believed it, and because um, Hate was only freshly out of prison for his first um, insurance scam, well, his insurance scams that he just recently got caught for, mm -hmm. um, he was sent sentenced to four years, years of penal servitude, aka four years in prison. Nice. It's a really fancy way to say that. I know. It sounds really nice. Um, just so you know, it was in prison that his mind turned to murder. Because, you know, prison helps people. <laughs> the greatest college you'll ever go to. Prison. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So, hate got out. Um, in the autumn of 1940, so he goes in 36, he comes out in 40. Okay. He got out a so little he, early. I was going to say, wait, did he do his whole four years? He got out a little early. Um, but mind you, when he gets out in the autumn, the Luftwaffle hits London. The Luftwaffle, maybe? Not Luftwaffle? I want it to be Luftwaffle every time. This is, I don't speak <laughs> German. <laughs> we need Kayla. <laughs> okay, so 1940, Luftwaffe Hit London with the Blitz, yes No bueno Because waffles are delicious and they should not be used for destruction Tell our German comrades that I don't think they have waffles That's the Belgians Oh my god <laughs> This is all getting cut out, I hope you know Please keep the part about the waffle planes in <laughs> Yeah, okay Anyway, 1940 okay. Luftwaffles London, Blitz, he's out. This is not great. <laughs> okay. So, Hate gets out of prison in autumn of 1940. By November of that year, um, Hate is living in London, and he, he is employed as a fire watcher. Yay! That seems like a really risky job. 
to give someone who's been in prison as long as he has. So, I, you want to know what he thought about his job? Sure, why not? He wrote to his parents, I love fires. I remember the fires during the war. I always thought it was a pity they had to be put out. They always fascinated me. He's like a walking, talking Criminal Minds episode before Criminal Minds was a thing. Yeah. It was quite a rough passage, but we are still alive to tell the tale. So why worry? But he was concerned about his parents' um, safety because there were air raids in northern England mm-hmm. as and Leeds had been bombed in March of 1941. Okay. So he has this one redemptive quality. He likes his parents. He deserves a cookie. I don't, I don't know what to say. Um, and then he gets... He gains honest employment and works for the Union Road Tool and Garage Company and ends up living with Alan Steven. I'm just going to, I'm going to give you a moment before I tell you the next thing, because I know you're going to be mad. Okay. So they, he ends up moving out because apparently Alan Stevens and his wife objected to Hate's association with their daughter, whom they felt was very young and impressionable but her do- their daughter left away their fears. <laughs> you can't see. She- Ashley is internally freaking out, and I can see it. Right now <laughs> we're freaking out. Just say what you're going to say. What? Basically, he How old is the daughter? Um, she's, like, like, early teens. No. No, no, no. I'm sorry I keep doing this to you. No. But nothing happened. He would take her to, like, the ballet, and they would talk about, like, philosophy She's still, like, 13, dude. Yeah. Mm. All right. So, His redemptive quality is null and void now. <laughs> That's why I made sure to tell you before that. <laughs> um, but Hate was moving up in the world because March 1944, he started living at the Onslow Court Hotel in South Kensington. And in 1945, he became a permanent re- resident, which wasn't uncommon. For the time. Hooray for him. Kensington, South Kensington's really nice. It it's is. really swartzy. Yeah. Swartzy. Is that a word now? <laughs> yes, we're gonna make it a word. Loof waffles and swartzy. <laughs> okay. Um, so now we get to the his first murder victim, um, the mixed wands, which is the parents and then the younger mixed swan. Um, so the parents actually had four rental properties. They owned four houses Mm -hmm. that they, um, rented out for income while they lived in another, another rental property. Okay. And they were deemed persons of good character. Gold star. Yeah. And their son was a businessman in his own right. He had a pin table business and he employed hate in 1937. Don't ask me what a pin table I, is though. I was just going to, so good call. <laughs> I, it, it was too weird and I didn't want to look it up. All right. Anyway, so he's his boss, basically the younger guy. Yeah. And if you look at the next picture okay, on. on the little slideshow, that's the younger Mick Swan. Oh, okay. And then the, the next one is his, that's his, that's his mom, I believe. Yeah. Oh, she's pretty. Yeah, she's really pretty. She kind of looks like the mom from Downton Abbey. Kind of. A little bit. A little bit older than the mom from Downton Abbey, though. Yeah. But, but yeah. Like face structure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can see that. Yeah. So, during the war in June 1940, the younger Mick Swan registered as a conscientious sure. objector. Yeah. Okay. Basically, he objected to the war to avoid military service. So basically, he said, "I object to the more this war on moral grounds." And you can't um, make me fight in it. Yeah, but hate also did this as well, and most people, other objectors, did. You just don't show up to the medical board, which is a way you could get out. So if you had, like, a heart defect or something like that, you wouldn't serve. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you weigh 90 pounds like Steve Rogers at the beginning of Captain America. Oh, he had a lot more wrong with him besides that. But I yeah. know, but yeah. 
Um, and then again, in 1941, he received his, his call-up papers, and he applied for a six-month deferment. So put it off for six months. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't know you could do that. Most people didn't. Hmm. Deferments weren't, like, especially with World War II, like, World War One, World War Two. it was really looked down upon if you didn't serve. Yeah. So, and this is what I think Down Abbey actually did really well, was showing, that, like, the shame. Like, it was very much part of patriotism and mm-hmm. pride in your country and everyone doing their part, where people who couldn't do their part felt ashamed. Right. So, after Haight had met the mixed swans in 37, they kind of remained in touch um, the younger McSwan visited him in prison, and um, they had seen each other in Tootig in 1940, 1941. Go UK for really rude names of towns and things. <laughs> However, by 1944, Kate, his interest in the McSwans was purely for that cold, hot cash. They were, I mean, they're, they're well off because they have these four rental properties, but Kate was very... Suave. Um, and he began to prepare for murder. So in August 1944, he negotiated for three rooms of a basement on Gloucester, Gloucester Road, which had an exit leading to the Meuse, which is like a, and a drain. So basically the Meuse are like a grassy mm-hmm. area. Then on sept- in September, um, he lured 37-year-old Donald William McSwan, a.k.a. Younger McSwan. Okay. Um, who had employed Haight as a chauffeur at an amusement park into his basement workshop on Gloucester Road. Basement workshops are never a good thing. He likes them a lot. Um, he would, though. He would, yeah. And then, this is all according to Haight, uh, he hit Swan over the head with a hammer, slit his throat, collected some of his blood in a mug to drink, Ew. Uh, and then placed the body into to a 40-gallon drum full of acid, and two late days later, he poured it down a mantle. Ew. Yep. Yep. Did you hear that? Yeah, I did. It's okay. It was in a quiet part, so I can edit it out. It's fine. Um, so, I think this is the worst part. Um, he... Cause, because he didn't kill the parents and the, the kid. The kid and his parents were close. Mm-hmm. He uh, went to his parents and told him that Donald, like younger, the younger McSwan, had disappeared to avoid conscription. So, so not only did he completely disrespect the body, but he also made him look like a huge coward and like ruined his reputation after he murdered him. Well, I mean, he wasn't going to serve anyway, but he well, definitely, no, made, like, but yeah. There's and a difference then, between objecting on a moral basis and just straight up running away. Yeah, but as the war was ending, July 1945, Haig did the same thing to uh, the older mixed ones, um, William 70 and Amy 65, at mm-hmm. the workshop on Gloucester Road. It was mainly because he couldn't keep up the pretense anymore, because if the war is ending... Right, where is he? Donald has to come back. And I think the shadiest thing he did was hate impersonated Donald saying he had power of attorney, and then proceeded to sell all the properties. And basically, um, it's estimated that he stole 8,000 pounds from them. And he used, he lived on it for the next two years, living and gambling. Ugh. I know, he's a garbage person. He really is. So then, after two years, he's skint <laughs> and looking for new victims, so he's He just needs money. So he comes across Dr. Archibald Henderson um, and his wife, Rosalie, and he rented out a new workshop. So basically after he was done, he would, like, he would uh, stop renting it. Okay. Um, And so, you know, someone else would move in and that contaminates all the evidence, Mm -hmm. but... Um, he re- rented a new workshop uh, in Crowley's West Sus- Sussex, where he brought Dr. Archibald and his wife Rosalie, which is they're the next, they're the cute couple picture on the. Oh, they are! Oh, look at them! And he 
murdered them in that basement February 12th, 1948, and forged letters which allowed him to take control of their assets. And at this point, he's figured, like, after the first murder of the younger Mick Swan, he realized he needed to protect himself from the acid. Um, and if you watch the murder maps, they do a really good image of him with, like, the leather apron, the rubber boots, the gloves, the gas mask, because, uh, you know, putting bodies into acid has its own, like, effect of gas in the air, so, and if he spilled the acid on himself. No, so, we're not that lucky. Yeah. Um, I'll try to find a picture to put up for you all to see of him in his full regalia. Um, however, his final victim... Um, was the one that got him caught. So, on February 18th, 1948, he decided to target Olive Durant Deacon, 69, a wealthy solicitor's widow who he had met while he was staying at the Onslow Court Hotel in Kensington, and he planned to just keep going with his perfect murder scheme, you know? Mm -hmm. Lure them to his workshop, kill them, and dissolve them in acid, dissolve her in acid. However, 10 days later, because um, Olive had friends, people were looking for her, you know, she was, this hotel had a lot of older women that lived there, mm -hmm. and so they were like, where, where is she? Yeah, so 10 days later, Haight was questioned by, and by the police, and then they searched his workshop on, in Crawley, which uh, revealed because he only um, left her in the acid for about a day, so it wasn't long enough. Mm -hmm. um, and the police found the evidence of his gruesome murders, including 28 pounds of human fat, three no. gallstones, a partially dissolved left foot, 18 no, bone no, fragments, no. Mr. Ant, Deacon's uh, dentures, and a piece of the widow's red plastic handbag. Because it didn't dissolve. Oh. Also, he had sold her fancy. I think it was like a fox fur coat or lamb coat. He did everything for money. Um, so on March 2nd, he was charged with his Duran Deacon's murder. <laughs> Sorry, it's a double D name. It's thrown me <laughs> off. Um, I really enjoy this. Two days later, he wrote to his girlfriend, Barbara Smith, from Lewis Prison to explain his motive. How foolish to ask why I had murdered you. Of course, I had millions of opportunities, I know that, but the idea never even crossed my mind. I wouldn't have hurt a hair of, of your head. The other business is some is something entirely separate and different. There was no infec affection involved there. I know the papers talked of six uh, widows, but they haven't got the whole story yet. There are men as well as women. How many, I don't probably... I don't know, uh, probably a dozen or more, and it was not just their money, but their blood I wanted, that I wanted. Is he going for an insanity defense? Why um, is he, like, oh, why is he bragging about, uh, I hate this guy. All right, sorry. <laughs> and there's also a picture of the lovely widow. I saw. She looks like um that one British actress from What a Girl Wants, who plays... <sighs> Yeah. Mary Colin Earth. Yeah. I don't know her name. I don't either, but I I totally know what you're talking about. Yeah. She's also in the Colin Firth version of Pride and Prejudice, by the way. Is she really? <laughs> Playing a sister. That's it's awesome. Fun. Um, so Hate went to trial at the Lou Lewis Assizes on July eighteenth, nineteen forty eight. So he really didn't kill for that long. No, um, but he did it real gross. He did it. He did a very good job. <laughs> he, is, he is a gold star for murder. For murder. Um, his claims of insanity, backed up by his supposed confession to drinking his victim's blood, uh, was rejected, and he was convicted by the jury after only fifteen minutes. Good. They called him out on his bullshit real hard. Good for you, British jury. Um, you go, British jury. He was hanged at age 40 at Wandsworth Prison on, at August, uh, on August 10th. And that is the Acid Bath Murders. That was very informative. Ashley, how do you feel? 
I feel like I need to take a shower. Not gonna lie. Yeah. Yeah. It's really gross. Yeah. Oh, I would like to thank our new podcast friends that we made, um, Wine and Crime. We suggest you go over and take a a listen. They are great. If you like pairing wine with a true crime topic, I highly suggest them. I mean, they got real in-depth. I'm only on... I was just listening to episode two, which is about arson, and they picked a wine that had, not only has fire in its name... But, like, has black pepper taste in the wine. Which I thought was, that's some real in-depth pairing. Oh, wait till you get to the Child Killers episode. The one they pair with that. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) Oh, it's magnificent. (laughs) Uh, So, thank you for listening to Cult of Domesticity. Rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes and SoundCloud. We're currently looking at other options, um... For posting so let us know what your favorite podcasting apps are and if you'd like to reach out to us on social media to do that you can reach us at domestic podcasts on twitter and our facebook username is the same but the page title is the cult of domesticity podcast yeah um so i think this deserves a long distance high five i would agree high five <laughs>